Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan. I would like to welcome you to the TRT World Digital Debates. Today, we are going to look at the tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean with specific reference to Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, and Libya. And also, we have got energy issues on the table as well. I have got excellent line of speakers here. I will just introduce them to you. Peter Millet, Özden Zeynep Oktav, and Sami Hadi. Uh, Peter Millet was former higher commissioner of UK to Cyprus and ambassador to Libya and uh, Jordan. He has served in a British diplomatic corps for many years and he played an important role in Libya when he was an ambassador there between 2015 and 2018. So he was also uh, ambassador in Jordan and he served in Venezuela, Qatar, Brazil. So he's a very experienced diplomat and I welcome him to our program. Thank you very much, Peter, for joining us today. And Professor uh, Zeynep Oktav, she is at the Department of International Relations in Istanbul Medeniyet University. She is a graduate of Bosphorus University, one of the leading universities in Turkey. And she has actually many books on uh, Turkey and especially on foreign policy issues. One of them is Turkey in the 21st Century, Quest for a New Foreign Policy Limits of Relations with the West. Turkey, Syria, and Iran. And also she is the author of The Changing Dynamics of the Arab Gulf and the Saudi Arabia, US, Iran relations. She has been a visiting researcher at Cambridge University and St. Andrew University between 2011 and 2013. Zainab, thank you very much for joining us today. And lastly, we've got uh, Sami Hamdi. He is the editor in chief of International Interest. He's been a managing director of the International Interest, uh, a global risk and intelligence company. He advises governments, civil society organizations, and think tanks in Europe and MENA region. And he is a regular commentator at Al Jazeera, Sky TV, BBC, and TRT World. Today, as I said, Peter, we will be looking at some of the tensions in the uh, Mediterranean. I would like to start with Libya, Turkish foreign minister and minister of defense and intelligence chief was were in Libya uh, last week and they had talks with the uh, new government, I would say. Uh, how do you think that will impact the unfolding of events in Libya, especially Turkey's role in the region? Well, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me onto this uh, discussion. Uh, in Libya, 10 years after the revolution, I think things are looking uh, a lot better than they have in the last few years. Uh, the defeat of uh, General Heftar after his attack against Tripoli um, has made a big difference. So on the military side, you have a ceasefire. Um, and on the political side, through the Libya Political Dialogue Forum, the process which was led by the United Nations, you now have a genuine government of national unity. The other competing governments have finally given way. But I would say that that piece is pretty fragile. Um, they, the government is supposed to be preparing for elections in December, but I think there are significant obstacles to that uh, to the prospect and the timetable, the roadmap uh, to elections. Uh, there are a large number of politicians and groups who are profiting from the status quo who don't want to see elections. There are many militias uh, who also are benefiting from the financial support that they're receiving. Uh, General Heftar hasn't gone away. Um, he is positioning himself and his relevance is through threatening uh, violence or threatening war. Um, and essentially what, what the government has to produce is some benefits to ordinary citizens. And that's where I think the international community, uh, including the Turkish government and many other governments, need to support this government of national unity to bring about not only the continuation of the ceasefire, and the preparation for elections, but genuine economic reform, which will bring benefits to uh, Libyan citizens. Uh, they are still suffering from electricity shortages. They need to tackle COVID, just like all other countries are having to do so. Uh, but I think a lot of Libyan citizens have lost uh, trust and confidence in their political class. That's why I think elections, which will clear away and bring in a, a younger, a newer group of political actors, will be an important step towards a more stable and a more prosperous Libya. Things are looking better, but it's fragile. Well, thank you very much, Peter. And let me turn to Zeynep. Zeynep, yes. you've been following uh, Turkish foreign policy for quite a long time. And uh, how would you interpret Turkey's involvement in the uh, Libyan issues? 
and uh, what will be the future of uh, Libya uh, without the Turkish yeah. involvement? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to define Turkey's role in Libya as a game changer. As you remember, uh, before Turkey uh, made an agreement with the Libya, for the delimitation uh, uh, agreement in uh, with Libya on uh, 27th November 2019, there were a lot of foreign fighters uh, and very interestingly um, outsiders like United Arab Emirates in uh, Libya. And there was a very big catastrophe uh, and people were killing each other, tribes, families, and it was a chaos. But Turkey uh, made this agreement with Libya and just intervened in Libya by making agreement with the UN recognized uh, government, uh, Saraj government, I uh, mean. And the, uh, Turkey really uh, uh, felt that it has a, a responsibility towards Libya. If you remember during Gaddafi's period, uh, Turkish Libya uh, relations were very close in economic. Uh, uh, terms, uh, I mean. And so um, after Gaddafi was brutally uh, killed by the Americans and by the Westerners, uh, Gaddafi uh, was dethroned, but uh, never peace never came to Libya. Right now, as far as I see, the, uh, although uh, Peter says the situation is fragile, at least uh, the people are not uh, being killed uh, when compared with the previous years. And uh, what we are expecting, uh, thanks to God, uh, Turkey and Libya are working very closely and cooperating with each other in stabilizing the region after Haftar was um, sidelined. Unfortunately, Haftar was not a UN recognized leader, but uh, despite this, uh, France, United Arab Emirates, Israel, Egypt, all of them uh, supported Haftar. And unfortunately, uh, Russia also uh, uh, waged a, a, a war, proxy war, by uh, just uh, making these foreign fighters uh, included in the uh, in Libya war. But now, as far as I understand, uh, the Bebe and Menfi, uh, the new government uh, leaders uh, and foreign minister of uh, Libya, also as you mentioned. Uh, paid visit to Turkey and the foreign minister, uh, Libyan foreign minister, very uh, currently made a declaration that they are ready to cooperate with Turkey uh, to, uh, to exclude all these foreign fighters from Libya. These are the good news for Turkey and very uh, hope. I'm very much hopeful about the future of Libya, especially I'm expecting the new government with the elections will be held on in December, as you all know, and I'm expecting the a very uh, powerful Libyan government will stabilize the region and the uh, UN recognized government will stabilize the region and economically and security economics will be better in Libya in the future. Well, thank you for explaining us the role of Turkey. Now, let me move on to Sami. I think from Sami, we should hear the view of the Arabs with regard to the Libyan crisis, because whether there's a one voice in the Arab world or there are different views for the uh, future of the Libya. And also, what is the view of the Arab world in general? Uh, as far as the Turkish presence in Libya is concerned, Sami? I think it's a polarized issue. I think you have uh, two camps and that's been made abundantly clear. You have the UAE backing Haftar with Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and you have the other side, Qatar, a partner of Turkey, working with Turkey in order to support the internationally recognized government. And I think that the direct answer to your question with regards to Turkey's visit uh, is that it comes in the context of Haftar having refused the Prime Minister Dbeiba to land in Benghazi. This is a show of force on the part of Turkey that we will not abandon the internationally recognized government and that if Haftar thinks that there is a possibility for a renewed military effort, then Hakan Fidan and the Defense Minister and the like went to Tripoli in force essentially to say Turkey is not going anywhere and just as we kicked you out of Tripoli before, we will ensure that you do not come near Tripoli again. Again, and the, this is where the concern lies, in that Haftar was able to reject or refuse the prime minister's landing in Benghazi, suggesting the limitations or exposing the limitations of this government that has come about as a result of the dialogue. It also indicates a concerted effort on the part of some Arab nations 
to continue the prospect either of a military victory or either partition between East and West, depending on how uh, Haftar's uh, dominance continues to be. We're seeing increased relevance of Haftar. We have to be brutally honest uh, with that in the manner within which Debeba is unable to appease him despite offering positions in the government to his sons. Haftar is still rejecting uh, the government uh, of national uh, unity. But we're also seeing equally this sort of multi-priorities or different priorities on the part of the international community. You have one camp which is more interested in ousting Russia than perhaps seeing uh, a successful government. You have one camp which is more interested in seeing Turkey ousted. And you have one camp which is more interested in finding some sort of stable solution, whether that's in a unity government or in the division of Libya. But the main interest is stop the migrant crisis, stop the security issues and find some sort of resolution. If you can't live with each other, at least stop fighting and stop causing a headache for everybody else. And these competing agendas, these competing priorities are beginning to spill into the effectiveness or limited effectiveness of the government. On the one hand, you have a European delegation that goes to Dubai and says to him, cancel all of your agreements with Turkey. The next day, a European delegation comes and says, get the Russians out. The next, the Americans come in and they say, listen, we can replace both the Turks and the Russians, uh, and we need to find a way in which to do that. And in the midst of all of this, this is why Haftar is able to, re or to resurge and find himself there once more. The final point, without going on too long with this, is that when we look at the powers that perhaps could potentially play the most important role in finding a resolution, and in this I mean Europe in particular, and the reason I say Europe is because the Turkey's role is to guarantee the ceasefire. Its military presence there ensures a military equilibrium that prevents a return to a military conflict. But the EU has the potential to act as a real mediator. But the problem with the EU is that you have Germany, which is insisting on a peace plan, on the parties coming together, on trying to form a government. But then you have France, on the other hand, which is absolutely dead set on reasserting French uh, sovereignty, over territories that it believes was part of its former empire. And I think we're seeing that even more clearly in the issue of Chad. With the death of the Chad president, France is essentially saying to the world, everybody, butt out, I will decide who succeeds in Chad. This is a French issue. It has nothing to do with you at all. And that's why we see France selling weapons now to Egypt, selling weapons now to Cyprus. France's mission now in Libya is about restoring French authority, given that France believes that it, it, it played possibly the most major role in ousting Gaddafi in bringing the NATO intervention uh, to Libya. Of course, this doesn't mean I'm trying to paint a black picture. What rather I'm trying to say is this, is that there are many things now that suggest that things are not going as smoothly as possible. And when the Libyan foreign minister from Ankara says, says that all foreign forces have to leave and Chaboshoglu has to remind her that it was Turkey's military presence that enabled her to eventually be in a position whereby she can now visit Ankara as a foreign minister of an internationally recognized government, that shows you that the baby is saying one thing, the foreign minister is saying another thing. President Minifi is saying something else. And this is because Europe is saying one thing. France is saying one thing. US is saying one thing. Russia is saying one thing. UAE is saying one thing. And all of the Libyan militias, as a result of the competing interests, find this breathing space within which to assert themselves uh, once more. And this is the complicated issue in that now you have an awkward situation whereby you have the uh, Turkey cementing itself in the Western Libya and supporting the government of national unity. Russia cementing itself uh, in the West, uh, backing Haftar and making sure that he remains uh, relevant, both cautiously accepting the prospect of elections. But the fear that I have is this, is that even if you have elections and even if you have results, if it is a result that the international community is not happy with, then there is no guarantee that it will be upheld or that it will be recognized. Because let's remember that Tripoli was left abandoned by the international community and Turkey had to intervene unilaterally. If Tripoli itself could not be rescued or there was no effort, there's no suggestion there will be an effort made to ensure this election. I'll finish okay. on that point, uh, but, but that's the gist of it. But it seems that things are really complex and complicated in Libya. And unfortunately, Libyan people are paying the price rather than the, uh, you know, the many actors who are uh, present in the, in the region. Now let's uh, turn our eye to Cyprus. Last week, there was five plus one meeting in, uh, I think, Geneva. But uh, when we look at the outcome, I think from you know, both the uh, Turkish side and the Cypriot side, the, uh, the prospects are not very uh, promising as, as far as I can see. Now, Peter, you have been involved in uh, diplomatic issues for many years. And also, I think Britain was part of the issue in, in Cyprus. It was, uh, Britain was there for many, many years. And after Britain left, uh, still we have got many problems. And of course, after 19, 73, 74, Turkey's uh, intervention, uh, the, the, isle, the island is practically divided and there has been efforts like Annan Plan, it's been refused by the Cypriot, Greek Cypriot side. 
And when you look at the issue, uh, you know, almost you know for the five, 50, 60 years now, what are the main uh, obstacles and hindrances for the for the solution, and whether there could be any solution anyway? I think uh, what is what is the British perspective on that? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very big question with a lot of history uh, behind it. And yes, the United Kingdom, along with Greece and Turkey, is one of the three guarantor powers under the Treaty of Guarantee of 1960. Um, as you say, there have been many, many attempts to uh, resolve the problem of Cyprus, uh, going all the way back to the set of ideas in the 1980s, uh, the Annan Plan in 2004, which the Turkish Cypriots supported and the Greek Cypriots rejected, uh, culminating in the uh, conference at Crans Montana uh, in 2017. Um, I do think the United Nations um, misplayed their hand in Geneva. Uh, I don't think it was a properly prepared meeting. It was always going to be a train crash, uh, and that's what's happened. I think it has probably made uh, a, a follow-up process probably more difficult at the moment than it was before. Um, and there are two completely different and opposing visions for the island at the moment. Uh, what has been discussed up to now is the, the mantra of bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. In other words, two zones, two communities working together with one single voice overseas. So one member of the European Union, one member of the United Nations, but within that one membership, you have two separate uh, communities, two separate states almost, but that's where it boils down to the, co the complex definition of what is a state. Um, that, so bi-zonal, bi-communal federation is what has been worked on for the last uh, 40 or, or more years, uh, and that's what the Annan plan, and that's what was being discussed at Crans Montana. At Geneva, uh, both Turkey and Ersin Tatar for the Turkish Cypriot community insisted on recognition of a separate state. And I think that is uh, a significant change of position. The United Nations hoped that they could build on what had been agreed before. If Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots are going to radically change their approach, uh, then I think that's going to make uh, a resolution of this problem uh, that much more difficult. I think there's also, uh, th there's always been going through a cycle of elections. And I think the, the political class in Cyprus has let its people down. Uh, for many years, uh, it was Ralph Denktash who was one of the main obstacles to compromise. At the Annan plan, it was Kassas Papadopoulos who was one of the main obstacle to an agreement on, and, and a, a f who, who signed up to the deal in, uh, for the Annan plan, but then called on his people to reject it. Um, there needs to be much more inclusivity of the citizens of of Cyprus. I do believe that the young people of Cyprus see that their island is a small island. They need to be working together. They can benefit economically by working together. The, the UN needs to do, for example, what they did in Libya. In Libya, they consulted widely. They brought in these 75 people who didn't represent anything other than different groups and so forth, but they weren't the political class. They exposed the politicians to public hearings. The UN needs to do something similar in Cyprus to expose it, the political class to what their citizens really want and really believe, which is compromise, stability, and economic prosperity. Well, I think that's, that's my a, first comments, but right, I, there's more I, to I, say on that. I think that's a, that's a very comprehensive issue that you have just highlighted the changing and diverse, you know, divergence between the uh, sides uh, and also recent Turkish uh, side decision to uh, ask for recognition as a, as a different uh, state. I think that is one of the turning points. So we will see how that will develop in the future. Now, let me turn to uh, Zeynep. Zeynep, uh, uh, what is the policy of Turkey with regard to the Cyprus? Whether there has been any changes, whether there has been any retuning of the Turkish Mm -hmm. towards Cyprus. What are the main parameters and paradigms, especially after the Cross-Montana talks? Uh, as we all know, in Cross-Montana talks, uh, we see there is a UN plan, I mean UN-based plan, plan, as uh, Peter mentioned, that the uh, to uh, be, be zone and be communal uh, system uh, would be uh, set in the island, but uh, 
I have a lot of things to say about this because uh, I feel very much uh, I feel very much unfair the, the existing situation. Why I, I feel unfair? Uh, because uh, it is uh, very too, it is too late to apply this system in the island, be communal, be zone uh, system in the island. Reunification. They talk about reunification, but from this time onward, I mean, uh, in the island for forty seven years, uh, as you mentioned, as you all know, uh, no one was killed. And the, you like or not, I don't know, but the stability was restored in Ireland since 1974. For 47 years, this long time. And the, uh, when I look at the uh, maps of the Cyprus in international platforms or in Greece, you see uh, there is one island. But this island, unfortunately, doesn't represent the Turkish Cyprus. They always exclude, ignore the Turkish, the existence of Turkish Cyprus. And they always, what do I mean by they? The EU, Greece, and Greek Cyprus. Three of them absolutely ignore Turks, ignore Turkish Cyprus, and ignore the existence of this commune in the island. And they pretend to be to. Uh, they pretend that there is a the, there exists only one island, but there is no only one island, as we all know. There is two uh, communes, and there is a, a, a border between the two communes. And the, for forty-seven, they are not interacting with each other. And Kofi Annan plan also, uh, we, we accepted. I mean, Turkey also supported, Turkish Cyprus also supported. They wanted to reconcile with the Greek Cyprus, but on every occasion, we were rejected. I mean, Turkish uh, Cyprus, Cyprus were rejected. Uh, therefore, in my opinion, Turkish Cyprus, Turkish uh, uh, Cyprus uh, are uh, resembling the Cinderella, and they are always struggling to be recognized to be treated equally and to be uh, loved and to be approved. They are always struggling and struggling and struggling, but all these hopes were dashed by the unfair practices of the EU, unfortunately. And the, uh, but uh, when you look at the, who is the stepmother of Cinderella, in my opinion, Greece is not stepmother. EU is the stepmother of Cinderella. I mean, Greek Cyprus, uh, uh, Turkish Cyprus, pardon. And the, uh, this, uh, this unfair applications, I can uh, tell uh, these applications or practices or uh, unfair uh, politi polit politics of EU uh, are so many in number. Uh, I don't have, maybe we don't have enough time to talk about all this. Uh, but I just want to uh, mention about the who is the prince of Turkish Cyprus. There, there must be a prince uh, uh, who will rescue this girl and uh, who will uh, uh, approve her because she wants really to be treated in equal terms, just like the EU uh, do, does towards the uh, Greek Cyprus. And let me speak a little bit about Cyprusness. Uh, this, this term, this concept is uh, very important to me. Cyprusness, the brotherhood over belonging to Cyprus. And there won't be, this is a only dream, there won't be any intervention of any outsider in the islands, namely Turkey, Greece, England, EU, Egypt, Israel, and you, you, we can say a lot of countries, I mean, who are interfering in Ireland. Uh, Cyprus is not only an island. Cyprus is a border matter, border issue for Turkey, in the maritime, uh, a maritime border issue for Turkey. And uh, uh, in, 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 in accordance with international law, uh, let me ask a question. What do, you, what do you think about the existence of 1960 Cyprus constitution? Does, uh, does it still exist? If, if your answer is yes, why these practices of EU, Greece and Greece, Cyprus still uh, against uh, 1960 constitution 
uh, and in, in, if you look, have a look at the uh, content of this constitution and the, on the maps, you should uh, include the Greek Cyprus, uh, pardon, Turkish uh, Cyprus, uh, I'm, uh, and the Republic, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. But uh, England, including England, EU countries, including uh, France and uh, Italy, and the Greece, Greece uh, is a spoiled uh, uh, daughter of uh, EU, as you all know very well. And Greek Cyprus also very spoiled, very much uh, sponsored, supported, funded for a long time. They never think of uh, working or struggling because they are so comfortable with the statico. And they don't need the statico to be changed. They don't need such international uh, meetings to be held. But Turkey always wants to be approved, to be to be understood, and uh, to uh, because Turkey's policies towards the uh, island uh, Cyprus are not offensive. On the contrary, defensive. Turkey tries to defend its maritime border borders. Uh, I think it is time to okay, thank uh, you. stop here and let, maybe later we can talk thank about Thank you very much. Further. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Now, uh, okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Zeynep, for this uh, very comprehensive, uh, I think, uh, introduction of the issue. And now, Sami, uh, let's now again turn to the uh, relations between the Arab world and Turkey and also including Europe. You know, in the Eastern Mediterranean, we, I think, observe and see that there has been rivalry and competition, and some of the Arab states are not very much in favor of Turkey, of course. Uh, yes. You know, what is the role of Cyprus? How, how far does Cyprus issue play a role, or there are more fundamental issues or more you know, uh, important issues rather than Cyprus? Can you please tell us what are the main reasons uh, between the the rivalry between Turkey and the Arab world. Not the Sorry, whole Arab world, I, of course, as I, you have can said, I ask this is also polarized, but... Yeah. Sorry, I interrupt. Sorry for interruption. Sure. Can I ask a question to Sami? Is Am I allowed to ask a question? Okay. Of yeah, course. Sami, Sami, yeah. Sami, which country are you from? I don't know, uh, but I, I think you're an Arab guy. Tunisia, Algeria. Tunisia, Tunisia Algeria. Algeria. Oh, how yeah, nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about the Arab perception of Turkish Cyprus? Uh, I mean, Turkish Cyprus is a stepsister of the Arabs or stepbrother of the Arabs or a uh, real brother. What, what do you think about it? I really very much wonder. <laughs> I, I think it's 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 they are loaded questions. They are very heavy questions, but I'll, I'll do my I mean, best to address yes. as much as possible. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate and, and I like Peter's rather human uh, approach to the discussion. Um, where perhaps I might differ is that uh, I think that the Cyprus is better understood in the context of raw, crude geopolitics, which is that Cyprus has always been an extension of a power's control over maritime routes or over the exertion of influence over the Mediterranean. Cyprus historically has never been seen as an independent entity, nor has it been desired for it to be an independent entity, whether it's the British who establish a military base so as to overlook the Mediterranean, whether it's the Ottoman Empire, which uses it to monitor the Mediterranean Empire, whether it's the Mamluks in Egypt or the like, we, we won't go back in history. But the point is, the reason why I mention it from this angle is because it directly links to the Cyprus issue as it is today, the crux of the issue, which is, as uh, you, Zainab, alluded to, alluded to earlier, which is the border, the maritime border. If you have an ally in northern Cyprus, then you are able to dictate larger maritime borders. If you have an ally in southern Cyprus, you're able to dictate uh, borders that are in favor of Greece or in favor of uh, Greek, uh, Greek allies. And I think uh, that's not necessarily the entire crux. If we go even one layer further than that, it becomes a matter of trust. The reality is this, in that when it comes to the Cyprus issue, Turkey is not convinced that the EU uh, offer is one that looks after Turkish interests, and the EU is not convinced that Turkey is willing to accept a solution in which the EU's interests or Greece's interests are also well looked after. And this trust has been deteriorating over the past decade, at least when we look at, for example, how Turkey has railed at the lack of EU support in dealing with the refugee crisis in Syria. The, from Turkey's perspective, the reason the EU didn't help is because they didn't want to pay a political cost for taking in refugees and looking after refugees. Let's remember the Brexit vote was all about immigration and refugees. Let's remember Salvini rose on an anti-refugee, anti-immigration platform. Let's remember that Merkel lost a number of provincial elections and the main issue was refugees. 
And Turkey, Erdogan himself and the AK Party paid their own political price for taking the refugees. They lost the Istanbul mayoral election. And you'll remember that Bin Ali Yildirim, the night before the results of the election, made a statement that was perceived as against the refugees because he realized and panicked that this was a major issue that they did not address and that the way to win the mood was perhaps to come out with something that can be interpreted as anti-refugee rhetoric. So the Turkish mm -hmm. perspective is that the EU didn't help because they didn't want to pay a political cost. Add to that, of course, the 2016 coup, where, as we see Biden with Myanmar saying we reject the coup, but Obama during the 2016 was saying we are monitoring the situation and we urge restraints between the parties, i.e. if the coup succeeds, we'll recognize it. If it doesn't, Erdogan, we didn't really support it uh, in the first place. And that sort of deterioration in terms of trust, whether it's regards to Libya, where Turkey's intervention uh, rescued the political process, but now the interest is about how to get Turkey out and how to drive Turkey back. As a re When it comes to EU, Merkel, uh, von der Leyen and Michel, they go to Ankara or Istanbul, they give one message to Erdogan, and then France and Macron comes in and says, no, 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 c'est pas comme ça. Like, I'm not having any of this. You know, the France's interests are this. I don't care what he said to Erdogan. I don't care what he said to Turkey. So there is this lack of trust. So when it comes to the Eastern Mediterranean, where Turkey is trying to assert its rights, and Greece is trying to find a framework to assert its rights, and Cyprus is trying to find a framework to assert its rights. The lack of trust means they cannot come up with a sort of framework. Turkey sees Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, Israel, UAE, trying to contain an expansive Turkish influence as they see, and Turkey sees that if it doesn't push hard for a two-state solution in Cyprus, if it doesn't guarantee the presence of an ally in Cyprus, it will pay the price many years later as the push goes even further towards Turkey, as the Arab states such as the UAE, as Saudi Arabia, as Egypt, believe that Erdogan's Turkey, and I emphasize this, Erdogan's Turkey, not Turkey generally. To Turkey pre-2003 does not pose, and did not pose anywhere near the threat to these Arab regimes as Erdogan does. Erdogan's soft power, the Islamic, the Islamic rhetoric that resonates with large sections of the Arab world, the, the, the idea that Erdogan stands up and says to Macron, we will not accept your inflammatory rhetoric, whereas Bin Zayed is saying, Macron, go ahead, do it, say it, we are with you. When Erdogan is coming out and defending these causes that are perceived to be Islamic, that in itself gives off this sort of soft power. That's what the UAE don't like. What the UAE are after is not Turkey in and of itself. The UAE would agree with a Turkey that is led by CHP. They would agree with a Turkey that is led by MHP. They will not agree with a Turkey that is led by Erdogan. And this is the issue here in that when we're looking at the Cyprus issue, one of the reasons why the EU is very slow to come to an agreement with Turkey is because there is this subconscious gamble that Erdogan might lose the next elections. And if he loses the next elections, the next administration, we've seen Babajan, we've seen the others all saying that perhaps it's Turkey's fault that our relations are bad with the EU, that Turkey will essentially put its head down, come to the EU and say, you know what, it was Erdogan, he was a bit erratic, we are a different administration, come, let's come to some sort of agreement. But here is the crux of the issue, and I, I know I keep saying crux, but let's, let's, let's say the, the, the crux of the issue here is that the, the, the dynamics of the relationship, what relationship does the EU want with Turkey? Turkey was not listened to on the refugee crisis in Syria, and it's paid the economic and political price for it. It was not listened to in terms of the YPG and the threat to its security and internal stability. It was not listened to on the maritime blockade that was forming by the UAE, Egypt, Cyprus and Greece and Haftar in Libya, which is one of the reasons why it intervened. What reason does Turkey have today, therefore, to believe that any offer by the EU looks after Turkish interests? What reason does Turkey have to believe today that the EU is sincere about finding a solution that looks after Turkey's interests? And this is why there is a lack of trust. I'm not saying the EU is a distrustful party. I think the EU quite simply doesn't appreciate the sensitivities. For example, when Sarkozy in 2008 said Turkey is not part of Europe, Brussels didn't go to Turkey and say, you know what, he was wrong. Brussels just said, ah, you have to still continue with the accession process. And when Turkey said, yeah, but you have France, which is saying we're not part of Europe. But essentially, Brussels didn't appreciate those sorts of sensitivities. The, the, the main reason why the Arabs are antagonistic towards Turkey is because of what Erdogan specifically represents, which is a successful model that wins democratic elections, which is a pro-Islamic leaning identity party. You'll remember in the Arab world, the post-Arab spring elections, it was the Islamists that dominated, that Macron called regression in an interview with the Grand Continent in 2020. He said this was a regression. We didn't like the results. Erdogan represents a reassertion of a Muslim power. And that answers Zainab's question in that people resonate with that. I resonate with that. The Arabs resonate with that. They resonate when Erdogan is speaking in this language that they can assign to rather than the traditional Turkish nationalism that has often been the common rhetoric 
in the past. And this is why Bin Zayed is keen to remove Erdogan, not Turkey. Bin Zayed wants to remove any possible alternative that might challenge the systems in the region. As long as Erdogan survives, there is this belief that an alternative exists, that we, with our identity, with our language, with our culture, we don't have to be beholden to Washington, we don't have to be beholden to uh, Europe, we can assert our right to self-determination. France can't dominate Algeria's proceedings, France can't decide who is the next president in Chad. Erdogan represents that. Even if uh, perhaps in recent times some of the decisions have been a bit alienating, but this is the crux of it. It's about removing Erdogan. And I think when we go back to the Cyprus issue, it goes back to this in that when you speak privately with diplomats in Brussels, there is the question that is often asked, do you think Erdogan would win the next elections? And basically the sense essence is this. If you say, I think he might not win, then let's be patient and wait. Let's wait for somebody else to come in who can be more amenable. And if Erdogan wins in the election, I think we'll see greater traction on the Cyprus issue. But to the last sentence I will say on this is this. Cyprus, not, there is not a single entity involved in Cyprus that is really bothered about Cyprus as a state or the self-determination of Cyprus or Cypriots or having a Cypriot brotherhood, a Cypriot state. This is about power dynamics. He who influences Cyprus has access to gas, underwater gas resources, can determine maritime boundaries and exert significant influence over the maritime routes of the Mediterranean and of the power dynamics in the Mediterranean. There is no reason on earth why Turkey would ever simply abandon that for the sake of uh, a party that until now has not demonstrated any willingness to take its interest into account. Well, thank you very much, Simon. I think you have highlighted the reasons much beyond going much beyond the Cyprus issue when it comes to the relations between some of the Arab countries uh, and Turkey. Uh, and the Turkish government. Uh, uh, here, I think in this context, EU has been mentioned on a number of times, Peter. Maybe we can also look at the EU's role in the Cyprus issue. When Cyprus was accepted as a member of the uh, European Union, as a full member of the European U Union, do you think that helped the um, both sides to find a solution or that made it much more difficult? Do you think that historical decision uh, was a right decision or it was not a timely decision? I'm not saying wrong decision because I'm not going to judge it, but what is your view? If you turn on your mic, that will be also yeah. okay. Um, I think the EU has always been um, um, something which attracted uh, both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. They wanted to be part of the European Union. Both communities wanted to be part of the Union, um, partly to modernize, partly to uh, get the economic prosperity uh, and of course that still has up to now has been one of the main drivers of the Turkish Cypriots who wanted all those benefits that they could see their Greek Cypriot compatriots uh, in, enjoying. Uh, there's always been the debate and accusations that Cyprus shouldn't have joined the European Union until they were unified but actually the, the whole process of enlargement meant that Tur Cyprus was part of a cohort of 10 countries uh, and Greece at the, uh, at the time made clear that none of them would join unless Cyprus joined. Uh, maybe that was a missed opportunity, but it is a fact that the Republic of Cyprus is a part of the European Union. I think the, uh, I think the, the European Union could actually play uh, a significant role in whatever outcome, if there is a negotiation. But more trade across that green line, which would be part of a, a, an EU regulation, the Green Line Regulation, uh, the Greek Cypriots have tended to block uh, sensible trade proposals uh, across the Green Line. Um, I think it would help the economic development of the island and help the Turkish Cypriot community in the north if they could do more trade uh, with uh, the Greek Cypriots in the south. So I think there, are, there is a role for European Union. Uh, it has to be alongside a UN-led negotiation if that is taking place, because the application of the EU acquis in the north would be of significant benefit to the Turkish Cypriots. Okay, let's uh, look at the uh, you know pros and cons, and also uh, uh, positions of the communities. You know, we talked about bizonal, biocommunal solution, but when you look at the uh, wealth, when you look at the I think opportunities seems that uh, Cypriots on the northern side, Turkish Cypriots, uh, did not really uh, feel that they had a good representation, they had a powerful representation compared to the uh, Greek side, uh, because Greece, Greek side was a member of the European Union, and European Union always, I think, had this uh, more positive approach to the uh, uh, Greek side. 
What is your view on that? Do you think the Turks, uh, Turkey side was left on its own uh, by the international community when it comes to the negotiations, when it comes to having a equal power around the table? I'm afraid it, it, it's the reality that the Republic of Cyprus, as a member of the European uh, Union, uh, is represented by the government in Nicosia, with, in other words, the Greek Cypriots. Uh, and the Turkish Cypriots don't have uh, a recognized voice in Brussels or elsewhere within the European Union. That can only change uh, if there is a solution. And that's been one of the main drivers of the solution, uh, has been uh, to try and uh, help the Turkish Cypriots gain that political equality and gain that political uh, gain that prosperity which would come from eu membership but at the moment uh, as zainab has said they're, they're like cinderella they're out there they're not uh, being recognized um, and uh, they won't be recognized unless they can find unless the international community as a whole with the help of the european union can bring the turkish cypriots within that equation of whatever it might be by zone or by communal federation uh, or some other construct that they can agree among themselves, which gives the Turkish Cypriots the political equality and the economic prosperity that they deserve. Well, thank can you I... very much. Yeah, okay, as then, it is great, Zeynep. Yes, uh, we just talked uh, with my students today uh, uh, at my class. Uh, we just talked about the 22nd article of uh, Cyprus Republican Constitution. It says, it stipulates that if uh, Greek uh, Cypriot, Cypriots uh, are uh, accepted to the full membership of the EU, Turkey as a guarantor, uh, guarant guarantor uh, uh, state should have been accepted as full member to the EU. Uh, the 22nd article of the uh, Republican Cyprus Constitution uh, is very open and very plain. Uh, if you just have a look at the content of the constitution. Uh, but unfortunately, EU is already aware that the uh, Kofi Annan plan uh, was uh, rejected by the Greek Cypriots. And the, uh, despite this, uh, Greek Cypriots uh, were uh, accepted. Uh, EU never minded at all whether Turks are uh, deprived of their rights or Turkey is deprived of uh, its rights. Uh, the, the thing, the issue I want to draw your attention is that EU is a part of, as Peter says, that a part of international community. But the, the issue is that the international community, including the EU, never minds the uh, Turkey's or Turkish Cypriots' rights uh, to be uh, taken into consideration. They do not con take into consideration the rights of the Turks at all. Therefore, uh, uh, I just made this, um, uh, I, I uh, drew, drew your attention that the Turks are uh, looking like, uh, resembles the Cinderella, always struggling, always trying to voice their demands to be accepted or to, to uh, protect their uh, rights in the region, in the East Met. Uh, for example, Turks are being excluded from the projects in utilizing the resources of Cyprus, like uh, uh, having the uh, submarine uh, pipeline agreement between Greek Cyprus and Israel. It is uh, uh, 2,000 kilometers long and the Turkey, uh, Turkish Cypriots are being excluded. Uh, they pretend that the Turks never exist in the, in the island. This is the question, I mean, I, I just want to draw your attention. This is unfair, and there are a lot of unfair applications of EU together with Greece. And the, uh, from the uh, 1990s onward, all the problems between Greece and Turkey uh, happen to be uh, problems between Turkey and EU. Therefore, Greece and Greek Cypriots are so comfortable with the uh, existing statu quo. I don't think that all these uh, five plus one uh, Cyprus talks or Crest Montana talks, um, other talks, they do not mind at all all these talks will be uh, resulted in a positive way or not because they are very happy with the existing stock. They are sponsored, they are funded, they are protected. They are the 
uh, real. They are considered as belonging to European culture, uh, unlike Turks. And therefore, when you suppress the Turks so much, uh, Turks have no choice but to have the two-state solution in the islands. Because, as I mentioned, for 47 years, so long time, no one was injured, no one in the island was killed, thanks to God. I, I don't okay, believe you, in an international community. I don't believe in international law to be applied in a uh, uh, in a uh, robust way. I mean, in a properly. properly. Sami, would you like to come onto this topic, or I think I uh, uh, I'll I'll say just a couple of sentences and then <laughs> and then I'll leave the thing. To, uh, but but what I am slightly confused about, uh, and and maybe it might be something somebody who's watching is also confused about, is that as somebody who's not necessarily party uh, to the conflict. It, is this idea that, um, I mean, I'm listening to Peter and listening to Zainab, they are talking about, you know, Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots as if they are an independent entity of both Greece and Turkey. Whereas the Arab perspective towards Cyprus, the UAE perspective, Egypt, etc., is that northern Cyprus is a proxy of Turkey and southern Cyprus is a proxy of uh, Greece. And that the, the Greek Cypriots, instead of uh, adopting neutrality in the Eastern Mediterranean issue, they followed what Athens asked of them. Uh, Turkey in northern Cyprus, they follow what Ankara uh, asks of them. And that the, the crux of the issue is that uh, at the end of the day, if we're talking about bringing the two countries together, the reality is that the Greek Cypriots are almost in tandem, work in tandem with Athens, and North Cyprus works in tandem with Ankara. So uh, when I listen to Zainab and, and Peter talking as if they are separate entities, the viewpoint amongst everybody else, to be brutally honest, is that they are mere extensions of the countries that sponsor them and the countries that support them. And if you're a Greek Cypriot in this context, and then I spent many years with a Greek Cypriot barber who loved to tell me about how much, you know, that he wanted Cyprus to unite and how the Turks were the problems and Turkey is always, you know, uh, goading and preventing the reunification. And then you talk to Turkish Cypriots who say, no, it's the southerners. The reality is that uh, if we look at, for example, and, and I'll strike the Palestine-Israel problem, one of the issues that the reason Israel doesn't want one state solution is because the Palestinians will have such an influence over the proceedings of the politics, they will no longer be able to assert their interests. And I think that even if you flipped it, Turkish and northern Cyprus would go along with Turkey's demands for the eastern Mediterranean instead of staying neutral. And, and southern Cyprus would, go, would, would defend Athens instead of staying neutral. So when we look at the Cyprus issue, my question or rather something that I want people to think about is to what extent is what Peter says and what Zainab says uh, as Cyprus having agency reflective of the actual reality? I think I can uh, maybe make some observation on the northern side, the Turkish side. I think there is a polarization on the on the northern side. As Peter said in the beginning, for example, Denktaş was uncompromising leader. And uh, whatever Turkey says, he used to you know do whatever he wants. And also former uh, president of uh, uh, northern Cyprus, for example, he was not in line with the policies of Ankara. I mean, there was yes. a, a very I mean, obvious uh, clash between the visions uh, exactly. for the future of, of Cyprus. Uh, so uh, as far as I think, I think the Turkish side is concerned, there is that agency as, uh, for, the, uh, for the Turkish community. There is a polarization. There are uh, different views. Uh, as far as the solutions uh, are concerned. Actually, this was one of the questions that I was going to ask Zainab, how Turkey uh, plays a role in the northern side to, let's say, convince the actors, because we see that there is a difference, actually, in the, in the northern island. Uh, when you look at the elections, you can uh, see it easily. I cannot make the same observation for the, for the Greek Cypriots, because I don't know that region uh, uh, in detail, maybe Peter can tell us because he's been a, a commissioner to Cyprus for 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 some time. What is your uh, uh, reply to this, Peter? Uh, Sami's uh, observation. Well, I think as as you said, uh, Dr. Talib, the, the the leaders of the two communities do have a significant voice, whether it's Nikos Anastasiades or Tassos Papadopoulos or Akinci or Tata. They are a party to this dispute and a party to any negotiation. Um, they do both look to their so-called motherlands. Uh, and I think uh, particularly the, there is a perception that the Turkish Cypriot leader can't do much which is independent or different or contrary to the interests of Ankara. Whereas I think the, the, the so-called leader of the, of the Greek Cypriot community or the president of the Republic of Cyprus 
uh, probably is a little bit more independent, but will probably coordinate uh, his positions uh, with Athens quite closely. So in short, yes, they are independent players, but they will always look to a lead from, uh, from their motherlands, from the Ath Athens and Ankara. Uh, and after all, there's going to be no agreement unless all those parties can sign up to any deal. Okay, now we have got 10 minutes left. I think uh, we will continue our debate. Uh, now I would like to ask Zainab uh, one final question uh, as far as uh, her time is concerned. Now, this is a contested issue and uh, the conflict has been going on. Maybe there's no uh, conflict at the moment, but it's frozen and there has been no solution. Uh, what sort of a solution to the Cyprus problem would be acceptable to Turkey? What Turkey really would like to have and how um, realistic is that? Uh, Talib Bey, as far as I see, in the future, there won't be a, a dramatic change uh, in, in for Cyprus. I mean, the, this situation will uh, continue. I mean, the, uh, what do I mean by this situation? Uh, no solution is a solution uh, from the Greeks' perspective, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, statu quo, existing statu quo is... Uh, they favor the existing statu quo. They are very comfortable with this uh, because they are recognized, they can sell their products and they are sponsored, they are funded by the EU. When it comes to Turkey and Turkish Cypriots, they cannot sell any products to Europe or any other part of the world. And no plane is landing on the airport of the uh, northern Cyprus. And therefore, there is a big inequality. I'm just emphasizing big inequality between the two actors, players in the island. There, they have to be uh, equal. Turks want to be treated in equal terms by Greece, by EU, by England, by the Middle Eastern countries, by Israel. And the, uh, therefore, this is the basic uh, thing. The, therefore, Turkey wants a, a amendment in the existing uh, situation because they are acting against international law by showing the Cyprus as the Greek Cyprus in the maps, in the uh, international contests or Olympic Games or something like that, whatever you you remember. But these this, this, uh, is very unfair policies. Greeks are arming the Greek islands, standing against international law. Maze Islands, as I mentioned, a very small one. They are arming Maze Island. Can you imagine this? This is a big shame, big shame on international community, including EU. And when you look at the generally at the propaganda, there is a very negative propaganda about Turkey because Turkey is being ruled. I mean, very dictatorial rule. Erdogan is dictatorial. They are expecting Erdogan's fall and the losing the, in the elections. Thanks to God, elections they talk about. Otherwise, they are sponsoring the coup d'état, uh, uh, military. Uh, uh, coup attempts in Turkey, sponsoring the terrorist organizations in Turkey. It is a big shame on Western civilization. I'm really very much ashamed, although I was educated at an American college, an American university in Istanbul, and I was a fan of American and English, British culture, but now I really very much ashamed of this culture. The, not culture, sorry, I uh, made a mistake, but uh, Western world's misapplications and unfair applications, I'm very much tired of. And I'm very much tired of being accused of being dictatorial. Erdogan is not a dictatorial leader. I'm very much openly saying not a dictatorial uh, leader. If you want to see dictatorial ruler, just look at the CC in Egypt and uh, and Netanyahu in Israel and uh, in United Arab Emirates bin Zayed and I can tell you a lot of names in different parts of the right. world and also Macron or just uh, remember what is taking place at the moment. <laughs> I gather, I gather uh, from what I'm you very said much is full. That there is, I, I, I'm yeah, really yeah. very much full. 
because right. I'm yeah. following all the news and I'm very much suspicious of British aspirations in the island, Peter, because as far as I uh, read on the newspaper, th does it reflect truth or not? I'm not that much sure, but the, uh, also uh, there are two British uh, bases in the island, in Cyprus. A part of this, and these are the British territories. I mean, just I yep. want to draw your attention. I know, I know, I know them you very know. well. The sovereign base yes, you know very well. Of the island, yeah. You know very well, yes. Unfortunately, Ottoman so Empire that, ceded I think that, the... Zainab, that yes, makes Talib Bey. Sorry, that, that, sorry, that, I, 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 I'm not diplomatic. I'm not no, no, very polite. I, no, uh, very much the, I, I apologize, but uh, no, no, you don't have I, to I really, apologize. I'm you really very apologize. much. Yes, uh, thank I'm you very much for. I am, I am intervening because of the time constraints. Otherwise, I mean, I uh, we can have I see. Long I discussion. wish we could I talk no a little bit more. Right. Sure. Yes, thank you very sure. much. And thank you, all of but, you. Uh, but what Peter I understand. Bay, Bay. No, no, no. We are, we are not going to finish. I'll go to Sami and then later on Peter. Ah, so okay. We will be about three I, I minutes more. Don't worry. Okay. Finished. No, I'm not okay. going to finish right now. But mm -hmm. I gather from your talks is that, I mean, you are not very optimistic about the at least no uh, near optimistic. Future, Unfortunately, uh, you see Cyprus the situation. Concerned. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Sami. Let let me ask you a more general question about the Turkish presence in the Eastern Mediterranean because Turkey responded very, let's say, strongly, sending you know ships uh, and vessels, etc., uh, in reaction to the uh, Cyprus and, and Greece, let's say, provocations as far as Turkey is labeling it. And uh, how successful was Turkey's interventions in, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean? What other options Turkey has in order to push its own agenda? Uh, this is a, a complicated question, and I feel like I'm walking on eggshells, but I'll do, I'll do my best to, 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 to give my point of view on this, in that uh, I think the Biden administration has altered the entire environment. I think that over the past decade, as trust deteriorated with the EU, Turkey felt that the only way it can be listened to is by using force operation in Afrin, in Syria, or whether it's imposing itself on the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey believes it has grievances that are not being taken seriously by uh, the EU, and therefore it has resorted to using force, whether that's in Libya, whether it's the Eastern Mediterranean, whether that's in Syria. And the reality is that when we saw, for example, the military operations in Syria, we saw at one point uh, Mike Pompeo and, and, and Mike Pence and Gina Haspel being dispatched straight from Washington to speak to Erdogan and offer a, a concession. So if you're a Turkish policymaker and you've seen how they react to force, then you believe that force is the best way to be listened to, given that you haven't been listened to diplomatically for a number of years. Uh, the reason why I say that Biden has altered the mood a little bit is that under the Trump administration, Turkey was imposing itself in the Eastern Mediterranean, saying to Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, Israel, UAE, you cannot make agreements without me being included. You cannot exploit the resource in the Eastern Mediterranean without including me. You can't dictate the maritime boundaries without including me. But of course, for Egypt and for the UAE and for Israel, the reality is that Erdogan's Turkey, and I repeat it, Erdogan's Turkey is becoming expansive, is becoming a powerful nation militarily, uh, economically, until not so long ago. It's still a manufacturing economy, but economically exerting significant influence in Algeria, in West Africa, uh, in uh, Azerbaijan, in these other areas. Turkey is becoming a regional power of weight and is no longer the security guard of Europe's southeast border. And that means that the dynamics of the relationship have to be changed. But of course, Europe or the EU are unsure how these dynamics should change. France is saying, no, Turkey is only the security guard and has no right to believe itself as anything more. And Germany is saying, why don't we talk to them? Let's come to some sort of arrangement. But when we talk about success of Turkey's policy in the Eastern Mediterranean, here's where I'm going to walk on eggshells. Under the Trump administration, there was a lack of American involvement. It was France versus Turkey with Germany on the side. Now there's a Biden administration. Biden is very keen, very antagonistic towards Turkey, very keen to discipline Turkey publicly, very clear to send a message to the world that America is back and that America's allies can no longer take unilateral action, whether that's the UAE, Saudi Arabia, whether that's uh, Turkey. The, U the, U the U.S. is here essentially to establish order. And I think that while Erdogan or, or while Turkey mold over how to react to that, I think when we see, uh, and it pains me to say it, when we see the manner in which Turkey is making major concessions to Sisi in Egypt in exchange for reconciliation, i.e. asking Egyptian opposition not to criticize Sisi uh, very uh, harshly, when we see Turkey offering drones to Saudi Arabia to use in Yemen as a bid of goodwill, when we see Turkey restoring the ambassador 
to the UAE, we see that Erdogan or, and Turkey specifically is, is rolling back. It's climbing down. It's essentially saying, OK, OK, uh, let's talk about it. Let's. And the reality is that when you look at Turkish analysts, they talk about mutual interest. But I promise you, when you look at Egyptian, Saudi, UAE analysts, there is not a single analyst talking about mutual interest. They are all talking about Turkey coming humble as a result of the Biden administration, as a result of circumstances not going in their way. We've also seen Turkey invite the Israeli energy minister uh, to Turkey in a bid to try to restore some of those broken ties. We've seen Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, Israel dig their heels in and insist that they will agree between themselves with regards to the Mediterranean issues. It, this is how it's being perceived. But what we're seeing, I'm, I'm talking about the perception, but what we're seeing is Turkey sort of rolling back. Turkey sort of saying, listen, OK, guys, I, I used the force. I made my opinion clear. Come and let's sit down. Come and let's talk. Everybody is suspicious. We saw some prominent commentators saying this is a tactic from Erdogan until the elections and after the elections. We'll see back the, the face that we saw beforehand. But the reality is that Turkey now essentially saying, OK, I'm ready to talk. And I think the von der Leyen didn't go in the way that perhaps Turkey hoped when she was left standing. I don't think the Turks intended that. I think that sort of, you know, they really wanted to show a good ties with the EU, but that sort of went wrong. And then, you know, everybody was sort of jumped on that bandwagon. But th my point is this, in that Turkey now under the Biden administration, it's seeking to shelve crises. Let's solve our issue with Egypt. Let's solve our issue with the UAE. Let's try to solve our issue with the Saudi Arabia. Let's talk to Israel again. Let's try to talk to the EU over Cyprus. And that's why I, I don't necessarily agree with uh, Professor Zainab when she is saying that she's not optimistic. I actually think the Cyprus issue might actually gain traction in the not so distant future, primarily because the Biden pressure will be hard uh, on the Mediterranean and Turkey will be seeking essentially to show some of these crises in exchange for uh, some sort of rehabilitation, some sort of peace. But the last point I will make on this is this. What Turkey must realize, what Turkey must realize is that its relations, its good relations with Euro with Europe depend on it being an inferior party. As long as Turkey is the inferior party, the EU is happy to deal with it and happy to develop good ties and relations with a Turkey that is not assertive and does not assert its interests, a Turkey that listens, a Turkey that obeys what Europe essentially wants. The moment Turkey asserts its interests, the moment Turkey says, I don't lie, I'm worried about my security in my southern border, I'm worried about the maritime issue, I insist that you listen to me, that's when we have issues. And this is why I go back to the crux of the issue as I see it, which is the redefining of the relationship between Europe and a strong Turkey, the redefining between the EU and, and, and a Turkey that is assertive and asserting itself. And I think Turkey is now reining back a little bit and opening the channels now uh, for a talk. But I do know that some of what I say sounds ideological, but it's important to stress, and I'll finish on this particular point, that the Arab Spring demonstrated that European foreign policy and US foreign policy is heavily driven by ideology, in that the Arab Spring dem democracies and elections were not supported because they made the wrong choices, because they voted for parties that perhaps were not necessarily the most favorable parties. And we've seen that uh, the way that Sisi was recognized and the like. In other words, it's become abundantly clear in that the relationship between Europe and the US and the rest of the world is built on, they call it shared values. We call it essentially uh, a relationship in which there is a superior and there is uh, an inferior. Erdogan has threatened that uh, dynamic of the relationship, and that's why I think there's been tensions in recent times. I think Europe's good relations with Egypt, its good relation with the UAE, shows it has nothing to do with human rights or democracy, but everything to do with geopolitical and power dynamics. I think we're headed towards greater talks. Turkey is reigning in, trying to shelve some of these issues. But I think after the Turkish elections, a lot might change. Nothing is permanent. Well, thank you very much, Sami. I think that's a very, uh, again, comprehensive analysis of different, I think, dynamics in the region and uh, Turkish foreign policy. Now, uh, Peter, I started with you and I would like to end with you this very, I think, uh, fruitful conversation. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what are the incentives that both sides can be utilized, the Turkish side and the uh, uh, Cypriot side, Greek Cypriot side, to move forward? Otherwise, things will be deadlocked, as Zeynep has already pointed out. This is, a, this is the first question. Second question is we have uh, talked a lot on the Turkish-EU relations as well. Do you think the, a closer relations between Turkey and EU will also help to find maybe a, a some sort of uh, acceptable solution to the Cyprus issue? Would that be an incentive, Turkish membership to EU? Well, I, thank you very much for those uh, last questions. I think on, on incentives, uh, I'll pick up the point that Dr. Zainab made about the Greek Cypriots being comfortable with the status quo. That has very much been the situation, that they've got their prosperity, they've got their stability and their recognition. 
and it didn't really matter if the Turkish Cypriots didn't have that equality. Um, and therefore, I, I tend to share Dr. Zainab's pessimism about the prospects. But I think there are uh, three or four new and different issues. The first one is the one that we've been talking about, about the East Mediterranean, the territorial waters, the hydrocarbons and so forth. And the Biden administration's determination to prevent that escalating into something which is a lot more dangerous than it has been up to now. Uh, and that provides a driver, a new and different driver, a political driver which, if the EU and if the US is, are willing to exert sufficient pressure on all the parties, then that is another driver, that's a new driver for a solution to the Cyprus problem. The second new uh, factor I think has been the combination of COVID, the collapse of tourism, um, the, uh, the, the uh, corrupt passport pro, um, situation they had in the Greek Cypriot uh, issuing passports to uh, foreigners, which gave them access to the European Union. That collapsed, which meant that the development uh, prospects of the big developers has collapsed. So there are now some new economic challenges for the Republic of Cyprus. And the argument about working with the Turkish Cypriots, working together to rebuild Varosha, working together on uh, tourism, on trade, that would bring economic benefits to both the Greek Cypriots and to the Turkish Cypriots. I think uh, the other new factor is there is a new feeling from civil society in both the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriot communities working together. Unfortunately, because of COVID, they haven't had much contact. But I think these can be used as drivers to try and push whatever process. But I think, as I said earlier, uh, uh, listening to the Cypriot communities, listening to civil society, bringing them together and not leaving it to the, to the politicians would be a sensible way for the UN to proceed. The other last point I'd make on, uh, in relation to that is that, you know, for more than 60 odd years, there's been a UN peacekeeping force in the middle of an, what is now an EU capital city. And anybody who's been there is just shocked to see that there is a, a, a United Nations peacekeeping force in the capital city of an EU member state. That can't, that can't be real, that can't, that can't last. And I think it is time to start talking about whether to withdraw the UNFASIP forces there. As Dr. Zainab has said, nobody's been killed, it's not that nobody has been killed because the UN peacekeepers are there. It's because nobody wants violence on the island. I think removing the UN peacekeeping force would be a new factor which would drive the parties to try and reach a solution. Uh, as far as Turkey's relationship with the EU is concerned, I think, first of all, bringing Turkey into the Eastern Mediterranean uh, forum for discussing gas, discussing the hydro hydrocarbons would be an important step. Uh, whether Turkey ever becomes a member of the European Union, I think there are some big challenges and some big questions there, but certainly a closer relationship with Turkey facing West and being that bridge into uh, the Arab world, into the Islamic world, is certainly in Europe's interest and something they should talk more openly and more constructively with Turkey with. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Peter Millet, Sami. Hamdi and Özden Zeynep Oktav, thank you very much for joining us today. We come to the end of our TRT World Digital Debates today. Thank you very much and goodbye to everyone from TRT World Forum. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.